My name is Mike Banja. I am a City of Atlanta Police Officer. I've been with the City of Atlanta Police Department since March 26, 2002. I spent the first five years of my career uh, working old 603 then 607 feet. I don't even know what beat it is now, but my beat was Cab Avenue down to Memorial Drive, Moreland, all the way east to uh, Kirkwood. Uh, so I had Hutchinson, Shipley, Mason, Hardy, um, and that was my playground from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. from 2003 to 2007 wow. by myself. Um, I had a lot of fun over there. It was a uh, different environment than it is today. Back then, um, Edgewood Shopping Center was a giant empty parking lot. It was the old Atlanta gas, uh, basically, parking lot. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Service um, It was completely empty. Back there, uh, back behind it, you had a number of large uh, housing developments that were mostly rent free. So your rent was uh, calculated based on how many children you had. So we had a lot of low income families, a lot of people struggling with substance abuse, things of that nature. Um, and I worked that beat and loved it until 2007. 2007, the area had become a little bit different. Um, Hutchinson Street, Chipley, Mason, all those things were, were uh, deconstructed. And they started putting up a different type of environment. Uh, my life was changing at the same time, I had kids, and uh, the opportunity presented itself for me to go to the academy. So for the next five years after that, I taught search and seizure and use of force mostly just physical, putting hands on people, at the main academy to police reports, recruits, and sworn officers. I did that for five years, and then the last two years, I've uh, been full-time at the range. Uh, all I do 40 hours a week is teach firearms. That's all I do. I never in a million years would have imagined that this would be my career. I had an extraordinarily politically liberal upbringing. My father is the head professor of medical ethics at Emory University. My mom was a reference librarian. There were no guns in my home. I was not even allowed to have a BB gun as a kid because my mother was terrified that myself and my brother, who fought all day, would shoot each other with it. Um, so, you know, did Paideia summer camp every year. Uh, been on the east side of Atlanta in Stone Mountain, Decatur, or Gwinnett my entire life. Um, and I never really would have imagined having the career assignment that I have today. However, um, my career before I became a police officer, uh, I played and taught music for a living. Uh, Berkeley College of Music alumni, I played and taught jazz music, and, uh, and hated it as soon as I began it as a career. <laughs> just hated it. Uh, I guess I just didn't do enough drugs to really enjoy it. <laughs> I did not enjoy being drunk all the time and spending five or six nights a week with intoxicated and irresponsible people in nightclubs just was not for me. Uh, so had that career change, said, hey, let's do something exciting, let's go do this, because why not? Um, but uh, a firearm, I quickly discovered, is no different than a musical instrument. All it is is a device, it's an instrument physically manipulate in this way and you get this effect. So very quickly in my career, having never been a gun person, uh, I realized, oh, this is the same as an upright bass, bass guitar, guitar, trombone, trumpet, drums, anything else, piano. It's just an instrument. Manipulate in this manner and the result will be what you're after. Uh, having a background in teaching, you know, it also helped to be able to show other people how to do this same thing with this instrument. So. My full-time assignment right now is teaching Atlanta police officers how to do things to other people which cause serious injury or death. And that's what I do 40 hours a week. Um, what I've been asked to do here today is conduct about an hour and a half with time allotted at the end for questions on firearm safety and Georgia firearm law. What we won't be talking about at all is when can I shoot somebody and what's the best thing to shoot somebody with and uh, what are the laws in Georgia about shooting someone? Uh, well, what if I have a this or that or the other thing, can I kill somebody? And we won't be doing that at all. That, at minimum, would probably be about eight hours. 
uh, simply because there's such a wide variety of factors that go into whether or not someone would or wouldn't be justified in using deadly force. One, so much so that we can't even begin to hypothesize. And then even worse, you change one little variable, you're on the other side of the line. So today, mostly what we focus on is if you choose to keep firearms, if you choose to carry firearms, some things that you should think about in order to make an intelligent decision when doing so. Uh, I'm the type of person that, uh, I'm very eccentric, but at the same time, I never assume that I know everything. Um, so even if you've been handling guns your entire life, there will probably be something in here that you get something out of. If anything, you may be just absolutely concrete opposed to any person having or bearing arms. That's fine, all right? But you'll get out of this information and knowledge that you can use to solidify that opinion. And if you engage in debate or argument or posture, you use the correct terminology and language to intelligently defend your position. So that's my goal. Um, so, moving on. Uh, Come on, clicky. Oh, I gotta plug clicky in. With every gun everywhere, there has been recognized for centuries as being four simple rules. With every gun everywhere. The first one is that you recognize it for what it is. It is an instrument designed to cause serious injury or, dread, or death. So you treat it as such. It's not a toy. It's not a, uh, a workout tool. It's not uh, anything other than an instrument for causing serious injury or death. So we want to treat it as though it is, and we want to treat it as though it is always loaded. There is no such thing as saying, uh, well, the firearm's unloaded, so I can do whatever I want with it that I wouldn't do otherwise if it were unloaded. We always treat guns as though they're loaded. If we're just retaining possession of a gun, whether it be from a closet or a safe or from another person, the first thing that we have to do is determine the status of that weapon. So the second one is never allow your finger to touch the trigger unless you intend to fire. We do this by keeping our finger in what we call the home position. We'll explain this later on. But basically, instead of keeping finger on the trigger, my finger is straightened out alongside the frame of the weapon. And it stays there until I make the decision to fire that gun. This is something that must be uh, made habitual through repetition. So oftentimes what people find themselves doing is they find themselves under stress, they find themselves uh, in unfamiliar surroundings, it might be as simple as you taking a, a gun class somewhere. And okay, I've never done this before, but I know that to make the gun go bang, I put my finger on the trigger. So every time the gun comes out of my holster or my bag, I'm going to put my finger on the trigger. That's not the case. Until you make that decision to fire, your finger stays on the frame of the weapon in that home position. The third one is never allow the muzzle to point towards anything that you are unwilling to destroy. That muzzle must be pointed in a direction at all times to where if the gun goes bang, it causes minimal property damage and absolutely no injury or death. This is why police officers wear guns in holsters. Otherwise, we'd simply walk around with them on our hands. It would be much faster that way. But we have to do other things and we have to manipulate things and we have to eat and drink. So we put that thing in a place where we can get to it if we need it, but it, at all times it's pointed in a safe direction. We'll talk about what constitutes a safe direction later on. The last one is what we must know our target and what is beyond it. So this applies everywhere. All these four rules, they don't apply just when I'm you know, shooting a gun at somebody else. They apply at home, they apply at the range, they apply in my car, they apply in a parking lot. Every time you and gun come together, these four rules must be present. This last one means that I have to have a little bit of thought beyond what I'm doing, even under stress. Uh, most walls don't stop bullets. They don't. 
So we have to know our firearm, we have to know our ammunition and what they're capable of, and we have to be able to make an accurate determination of what the final resting spot of that bullet will be. Another thing that we have to think about is directions in which it may be safe to fire, even under stressful conditions. Uh, this last one is very simple. If there is anything past your target, it may not be the best idea to shoot. Um, I can relay several uh, life situations. I was involved in a um, in an incident, uh, one of many down on Moreland Avenue in a nightclub that we used to have called Club Libra, uh, which was a wonderful, wonderful place. And uh, long since closed, uh, they slapped up an Aldi there now. Um, in a advance auto, I think. That darn gentrification. Yes, yes. So Ruined your club, Libra. I know you miss it. Um, long story short, I was presented with a situation in that parking lot where legally, and probably in the best interest of maintaining myself, I should have shot a person several times. However, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and there were 300 people coming out of the nightclub behind him. Okay, In that set of facts and circumstances, it was not the right thing to do to start firing my weapon in his direction. Because if any weapon, if any round that I fired would pierce through his body, it would undoubtedly hit another person. Or if I missed, it would undoubtedly hit another person. So this fourth rule is vital, even to have in mind during stress. We have to examine what a firearm is intended to do. Firearms are used for all sorts of purposes. Tons of purposes. But they're designed to do one thing. So let's talk about some of the things that firearms uh, are used for. Uh, firearms are used for target practice. Uh, it's, a, it's a very relaxing thing. It's a, it's a wonderful hobby to have because it disconnects you from everything else in the world. With such a, a dangerous thing in your hand, you're almost consumed by concentration on sight alignment, trigger control, muzzle direction, and hitting the center of that target. Uh, there's a, an entire philosophy based behind this. If you read the Zen and the Art of Archery, a wonderful book, uh, it, can, it can even venture into religious uh, elements of shooting something, be it an arrow or a bullet. Um, so that's one of the things that firearms are used for. Firearms are used for political statements. There are people who openly carry weapons out there in the world uh, more so to politically make a statement about what they believe in than to protect themselves or someone else. Um, there are these people out there and that is constitutionally protected activity whether we agree with it or not. Uh, there are people who with all sorts of psychological uh, you know, issues or, or elements feel the need to have that power that they have the ability to end someone else's life. Uh, uh, for a variety of psychological reasons. These may be completely normal, law-abiding, non-dangerous uh, people, but they just feel that compulsion. I need to know that it's there, that I can defend myself if need be. Uh, you have several people who um, carry guns because it's, it's a simple way of life where they live. Uh, you go down to South Georgia and you go walking in the woods every day, in the swamp every day, there are things out there that are going to kill you and eat you. Uh, so that, in combination with being able to put food on the table, brings firearms into that way of life. But the majority of people in Atlanta that I encounter that talk about carrying guns are mostly worried about that self-protection. Uh, so we'll focus on that mostly today. But it's important to remember that all firearms are designed to do one thing. They are designed to propel pieces of metal at speeds which cause serious injury or death. That's what they are designed to do. They're not designed for anything else. So starting with that basis, that's our concrete pad under the rest of this. We have to look at what hotlophobia is and we have to talk about some incorrect assumptions about all types of firearms. Hoplophobia is uh, a word coined by a, a great military theorist, a guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Cooper. Um, and basically, if we, if we look at the Latin roots of it, the hoplites were the Romans who carried weapons and 
part of the Roman army. So from that we get hoplophobia, which is the fear of weapons, just a completely, almost irrational fear of weapons. Uh, weapons do not possess free will. They do not. A weapon is just as dangerous as any other object in the world, because any other object in the world can be viewed as being capable of causing serious injury or death. Uh, I've taught both law and violence for seven years, and pretty much using any instrument, I can show you how to cause death with, death with it. Uh, vehicles, motor vehicles, kill a, an, an uncalculable number of people more than firearms every year. It's the manner in which that is used by a human being who is in possession of free will and reasoning that causes that serious injury or death. So we have to get over the idea that all weapons are not bad in and of themselves. And second of all, we have to begin to look at the, the reality that on a weapon's appearance says nothing, absolutely nothing, about its capability to wound or kill. Um, I, I truly wish that, that the people who, who use guns for political purposes, both on the right and on the left, would both go to the same types of classes and just not be allowed to talk for a while. <laughs> um, and the reason why I say that is because when you watch people speak, they say so, so many things that are just horribly incorrect. But because they have been chosen as a spokesperson for that political side or another, the rest of the audience buys into it. That shoulder thing that goes up, that's not a real part. I don't know. The shoulder thing that goes up? Right. To which are you referring to? I mean, exactly. It, it, yeah. Um, there's, there's all kinds of examples in the media of this. Um, and there's, there's, you know, repeat offenders as well. Uh, there's people in the media who get on there and say, this gun should be banned, and this is horrible, and this is. Uh, this is a real killing gun. This is a ghost gun. And, you know, you look at it and it's like, okay, well, let's see what that is. That is a shoulder-fired semi-automatic rifle that fires this caliber of gun. The only thing that separates that from this is that it was designed in a certain way to look a certain way. Um, you know, it would be like putting a racing body on a Kia. <laughs> does not in and of itself make it a race car. Uh, like you can put a Formula One body on an F-150 engine, you're not going to really get that much bang out of it. It's just So a weapon's appearance and its design has absolutely nothing to do with its capacity to kill a wound. So banning an object or, or deciding against an object simply because of its appearance or looking at something and say that should be illegal, but this should, is really illogical. Um, I'm a fence sitter. Politically, I don't care. I'm not a very right wing person, I'm not a very left wing person. I have elements of both. Um, to me, what, what matters most is reason and logic. Um, this is a bullet. This is what kills people. This is how it does it. This is a gun. This is what delivers it. Uh, what should be illegal? I don't know. Um, the act of killing people, that should be illegal. <laughs> that should, you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a big obstacle to anything else out there in the world. Uh, a classic example, um, when, they, when these folks get called on it, ma'am, do you know what a muzzle break is? No, but I think it should be illegal. That is not an intelligent means of defending your position. So if you seek to develop a position, you have to have the background information about what something is, what it does, and the reality of what separates it from others before you decide that this in and of itself is bad or should be illegal. Uh, another great example before we move on. Because your friends will ask you these things, you'll develop, you know, you'll engage in debates over these things. You went to a gun safety class? What's wrong with you? Um, let's look at the Aurora movie theater shooting. Uh, other, what's commonly referred to now as the Batman shooting. Let's walk through the play-by-play -play of what happened there. Uh, that guy walked into that movie theater with the intent of killing everybody in there. That was his goal. 
and being taken alive afterwards or being killed by police officers. That was his intent. So to do so, he bought the equipment that he believed would enable him to do that a lot. And he bought it based on political statements about these things kill people. So one of the first things that he purchased was a, what's called an extended capacity magazine. A big magazine that fits into a rifle that gives you the ability to fire 200 rounds without reloading. Okay? Well, folks, I can reload a gun in around about three quarters of a second. So, how much time was he really saving with this uh, investment? Not much. Um, he brought a handgun and a shotgun. He goes in there and he begins to kill people with his shotgun. And the plan was, I'm going to kill a lot of people with a shotgun, then I'm going to drop that, and I'm going to kill a lot of people with my rifle, and then I'm going to shoot it out with the police probably with this handgun. So he goes in there and he shoots and kills several people with that shotgun. Then he drops it and he goes to that rifle that big extended capacity magazine, okay, 200 rounds. And he gets off a shot or two, and then it malfunctions. Because these things aren't designed to work that way. They're not designed to hold 200 rounds. It's a big spring, and it binds up inside of itself. And if you don't have every round seated in it the right way, it's not gonna be, all right? It malfunctioned after a couple of rounds. And he spent about two minutes inside that movie theater trying to unclog the malfunction that that magazine had created. Two minutes. There's live bullets all over the ground where he was standing because he's just ejecting them, trying to get the rifle back into the fight. Eventually, after about two minutes, he gives up, he throws it on the ground, he shoots a few more people with his handgun, and he walks outside of the movie theater and leans up against the police car. He spends the next six minutes leaning up against that police car until somebody says, excuse me, officer, that's the guy who just killed people. But yet in the media, one of the very first things that, that rose out of that shooting was several politicians saying, this is the exact reason why we need to ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines. Look at how many people this guy killed with his assault weapons and high capacity magazines. When in fact, the only thing that saved all the people in that horrible tragedy was the fact that this guy bought a crappy piece of gear mm -hmm. that didn't work that just because other people said that this thing is more dangerous than anything else. So I love it. I think we should issue extended capacity <laughs> magazines <laughs> to... Uh, you also yeah. lack the understanding to properly uh, clear that malfunction of that rifle. As well, you know, but at the same time, does the object itself do something? No, no it doesn't. We go back to that free will and intention. There are four types of firearms, and we can break these down into variations of each one. But first and foremost, we have rifles. These are typically fired from the shoulder, and they fire a single projectile for every pull of the trigger. Then we have shotguns. These are shoulder fired, but they fire multiple projectiles, typically. They fire a plastic shell which contains several small pieces of metal. And the idea behind this is that you don't have to be that accurate. All these pieces of metal come out the barrel, go in all sorts of different directions in a pattern, which is typically in close distances about a foot to a foot and a half wide. So if you're going after turkeys, you don't have to be the super marksmanship. You know, point this thing in general direction of turkey, pull trigger, and you will have food. All right. That's what these were designed for. They fire shot instead of one single projectile. Then you have pistols. These are handheld and what are called magazine fed. You have a box or a stick that the bullets go into and then the box or stick goes into the gun and then every time the gun recoils it spits out the empty casing and loads in another one, typically. And we'll talk about the specific nomenclature of these types of guns when we get to them. And the last one is what's called a revolver. These are handheld. They're different from pistols in the fact that they don't have a magazine. They don't have a removable box that you put bullets in. 
they've got a cylinder in which the bullets are contained, and the cylinder spins. And we'll talk about how that developed and where it came from shortly. So these are our typical four types of firearms. Rifles, shotguns, pistols, and revolvers. <coughs> One of these is not more deadly than the other. Okay? You can assault someone with any of these. That does not in and of itself make it an assault shotgun or an assault pistol or an assault revolver. That nomenclature is used to sell things and further political objectives. Okay? So, those are our four types of guns. That's how they operate. Some of the proper terminology that you need to use if you wish to sound intelligent when debating these things is the use of the word automatic. A weapon that is fully automatic means that as long as there is ammunition contained in that magazine and you hold down the trigger, that weapon will continue to fire. It fires at what's called a cyclic rate which is typically in hundreds or thousands of rounds per minute. Now I've never seen a magazine big enough to enable someone to fire a thousand rounds in one minute. Typically what you get is a 30 round magazine that gives you the ability to fire 30 rounds in a period of time typically less than five seconds. All right, so fire 30 bullets in less than five seconds. Uh, if you do this in one single trigger pull, it is highly doubtful that you will hit anything. <laughs> because controlling a fully automatic weapon in an extended series of firing is incredibly difficult. What happens as soon as that weapon starts recoiling is it's like trying to keep a jackhammer pointed in a specific direction, not on the ground, but pointed up in the air. It's very difficult. Uh, it can be done with practice and you learn how to manipulate your balance. I can do it. I've been invested a lot of time in doing it. All right? If someone doesn't have the time and ammunition and capability to do it, they won't get the same results. But that's what fully automatic means. So you pull the trigger and it just come out and then stops. In order to be fired again, you would need to reload it with another magazine. The term semi-automatic means that every time you pull the trigger, it will fire the bullet. The casing which holds that bullet will go spitting out the side of the gun. And then the bolt of the firearm, which is kind of like the piston that keeps it going, will pull back to eject that casing and it'll load a new one into the chamber ready to be fired again. In order to fire it again, you have to release the trigger and squeeze it again. So it takes an individual action still to fire every one of these bullets. That action of pulling the trigger is what shoots the gun, and the bullets only come out of the barrel one at a time. Now I want you to stop and consider this for a second. If you go to Europe, they consider shotguns to be the most dangerous evil weapon on the planet. All right, You can't run around the world with a shotgun. But their police officers run around with fully automatic submachine guns. Okay. The reason for that is because they want their police officers firing smaller bursts of bullets towards someone as opposed to sending nine nine millimeter bullets flying in someone's direction out of a shotgun shell. Because that's what a double lot buckshot fires. Nine nine millimeter bullets. So we look at it in terms of the political context. 31 to 32 caliber. All right. If we want to look at it in the political context, with one pull of that trigger, that fully automatic weapon is going to go all over the place. But that shotgun, one pull of the trigger, fires nine projectiles out the barrel. All right. Would be able to cause a lot more physical trauma to that person. And it doesn't matter how that shotgun's set up, kids. It can have a black nylon tactical super stock with all sorts of gadgetry hanging off of it. Or it can be that shotgun that your great great granddaddy carried around, you know, that only has two barrels in it, or two shells in it. That thing gets pulled one time, nine projectiles go spitting out the end of it with that particular type of ammunition. So again, we're coming back to that idea that no one particular firearm is any more dangerous than another. <coughs> 
So that's the difference between fully automatic and semi-automatic. When people talk about automatic weapons, I always ask the question, well, you said he has an automatic weapon, what well, kind? Semi-automatic or fully automatic? Because there's a big difference. When people speak in that manner, what it typically says is, I don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but this sounds like it's really bad. There are two types of ammunition. There's what's commonly referred to as ball ammunition, and there's what's commonly referred to as hollow point ammunition. Ball ammunition involves one single piece of steel, or lead, or any other type of metal, which is formed into, for lack of a better term, a ball, and then covered in a jacket of a different type of metal, usually copper. And that jacket is what holds that ball together as it's flying through the air. Lead is a very soft metal. And if you shoot a lead bullet with no jacket, as soon as it starts leaving the barrel, it starts changing shape because air pressure is hitting up against the front of it. It's what we call external ballistics. So that I want to keep that projectile kind of looking like a football so that it'll spin through the air and retain its accuracy. So I put this copper jacket around it so that it kind of retains its shape. That's ball ammunition. It's typically used for target practice. It's also used in war because the military cannot use, if they are in accordance with the Geneva Convention and NATO rules, they cannot use any ammunition which is designed to create multiple or traumatic, more traumatic wound channels, what we call hollow point ammunition. So that ball ammunition, typically you see that stuff, it's designed for shooting paper. That's what it's designed for. Hollow point, or what we call controlled expansion ammunition, is designed, specifically designed, to create multiple and more traumatic wound channels. All right? So the idea behind this is if I construct the bullet to change its shape during flight and upon impact, I can do more damage to meat and vital organs. That's the idea behind it. So oftentimes when controlled expansion ammunition hits a human body, it will fragment into different pieces, and those different pieces will go off in different directions inside the body. What this does is it causes blood loss more rapidly than typical ball ammunition. But then again, that in and of itself does not make it more uh, dangerous than ball ammunition. Someone who is shot directly between their eyes, the center of what, they, what we call the cranial vault, with ball ammunition, all right, is in pretty bad shape. Uh, someone who gets shot, I don't know, in the calf with hollow point ammunition, all right, is also in pretty bad shape, but yeah, a couple, a couple of minutes down at Grady, they'll have that problem tightened up for you. All right. So, one of these is not by its very nature more likely to kill than the other, but one of them is designed to do more damage to the human body. And largely this has to do with price. Because more technology, more engineering goes into it, one is going to be more expensive. So that's the difference between our two types of ammunition. Caliber is somewhat irrelevant to the actual size of the bullet. Caliber is more about a trademark than anything else. So what's vital about caliber is that we have to use a correct caliber of ammunition for the gun that we're shooting. We have to verify that this is the right ammo for this gun. Because the consequences of poor ammunition choices, mixing the wrong caliber with the wrong gun, are death, serious injury, and property damage. And none of those are good. None of those are good at all. Not every bullet will fire out every gun. And caliber is typically measured in metrics or um, in hundredths of an inch. But those measurements are not exact. Uh, they're measured and established through a trademarking and, and legitimizing organization called SAMI, which is man ammunition manufacturers. And each person who develops a type of ammo it has the ability to make it whatever they want to. If they want to call it the nine, but yet it's a half inch barrel, that's fine. They can call it whatever they want to because they invented it, because it's only designed to go in a specific style of gun. Um, so how do I know which one is, is, is right? Well, on the barrel of every firearm, most of those that are, have been built since 1935 in America, the caliber of that weapon has to be engraved or stamped on the barrel of that firearm. 
so you can read the side of the barrel and see exactly what that gun is intended to fire for almost 100 years now. If you're dealing with something older than that, take it to a gunsmith because they're going to tell you don't shoot it, it's really old. <laughs> so, so I read the side of the barrel to determine what caliber goes in my gun. I buy ammunition that is specifically designed for that gun according to what I intend to do with it. Caliber is, uh, like I said, either named in hundreds of an inch or nine or, uh, or millimeters. Um, and what happens is after the caliber measurement, they typically tend to put a word after that to brand it to a specific type of firearm. Uh, for example, you'll see nine millimeter Parabellum, nine millimeter Luger, uh, you know, just nine millimeter NATO. Okay, all three of those are actually the same thing and fire out of the same weapon. Nine millimeter Makarov is a completely different type of bullet that fits in a completely different type of bun, gun. But you walk into a store and say, well, I need to buy some nine millimeter, that stuff looks really cheap. And you buy it, and you get home with it, you go to the range, you find, lo and behold, it doesn't fit in your gun. Or if it does fit in your gun, it might injure you or damage your gun. Um, so you have to read these things specifically. And if you don't know, ask. Go to the places where, where the, the level of knowledge is, is reasonably dependable. Uh, a shooting range. They don't want you to blow yourself up in there. So, you know, when you go in there, ask those folks because they'll tell you what will and won't damage your weapon or injure you. The nomenclature of a revolver. All right, so, 1836. All right, 1836. Uh, let's look at the state of guns. The majority of guns required someone to pour powder into something, okay? Then put a piece of metal down the barrel and kind of push it into place, you know, with a little bit of cloth so that it stayed put and didn't just roll out of the barrel. And then you had to have some type of other explosive, something akin to a match head or something else, that you'd put in there with the powder and then light it on fire at a specific time. Okay? There's a lot of stuff coming together. Uh, but that was the nature of war back then. People would take the field, opposing each other at a certain distance, and they would fire in volleys. I mean, these guys would shoot their gun and then reload as fast as they can, and guess what they're doing while they're reloading? The other guys are shooting at them. And if you got hit so well, eh, that was the way wars were fought. Um, then people started doing different things. Man, I, that, that, that doesn't, the idea of standing there taking a, you know, a good solid 30 seconds to reload my gun, that doesn't really appeal to me. I don't like that. While people are shooting at me, I want to make this process a lot more seamless. So they started doing things like containing all the powder and the primer and the bullet itself into one cartridge. All right? So as opposed to filling our printers, you know, with bottles of ink and, you know, ribbon and things like that, now we're putting it all together in one thing where we open a drawer, plug it in, and it prints pages. Right. Same idea with a gun and the invention of a cartridge. So, uh, a young man named Sam Colt, Samuel Colt. Uh, Samuel Colt worked on cargo ships that were up and down the east coast of uh, the United States and uh, went on a couple transatlantic voyages as well. And uh, Colt was their engineer. He was their problem solver, their fix-it guy. And Colt's hobby was guns. That's what Colt liked to do. Uh, and he, along with thousands of other people at the same time, were thinking about how can I make a gun that I don't have to sit and mess with every time it goes bang to make it go bang again. And he was looking at several things that were present on the cargo ships. And one of those was what was called the capstan of the sail. So to turn the sail on these massive cargo ships, they would use levers and a locking wheel. So a bunch of guys with a really big wooden pole would push up and the sail would be lifted off of the ship, turned a certain degrees, and then dropped down into place again. And Sam Colt thought, well, holy crap, that's a pretty good way to turn a wheel. What if I made a trigger do the turning and have a hammer hit a primer or have a hammer hit the bullet and just had a wheel with six bullets on it? And thus was born the revolver. 
Uh, he carved the first one out of wood and patented the design of it in 1836. And by the 1850s, that was the cool thing to have. Because no longer did you have to sit there and mess with a gun for a minute after every time you got shot at. It could be bang, 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 bang. Then you'd have to mess with it. So, that's the history of the revolver. Revolvers are still a wonderful weapon today. The basic design of them has not changed in almost 200 years. And for good reason. When you get it right the first time, don't mess with it too much. Don't mess with it too much. It is a reliable type of firearm because the design of it is very simple and mechanical. It doesn't rely on outside sources of energy to operate it. It's gear turn gear. That's the way it's designed. With a semi-automatic pistol, its explosion <coughs> operates everything else. That's a lot less reliable. So a revolver, while it's no more dangerous, is still a very popular popular firearm today. So um, what I want to do is, because we've been in here for an hour and it's hot, I want to take about five, ten minutes, and get out there, you know, yeah. fluids in, fluids out, do whatever you got to do. Okay.